Hey everybody, I'm Charlie Barrens and welcome to the Cripes Cast. This is the podcast where we talk to people for and or from the Midwest. And our studio is powered by Everlight Solar. Hey folks, how we doing? Welcome to another episode of the Cripes Cast. Today, we are talking about salt. Salt on the roads, not in your Bloody Mary. Although it is the same salt in your Bloody Mary. Isn't that interesting? Uh, what is all this salt doing? Colleen, do you ever do you ever wonder that when you're driving down the road and it's cold out and you're thinking of slipping and sliding off the road? Do you ever wonder what that salt is doing aside for keeping you on the road? No. Yeah. <laughs> well, most people <laughs> never wonder that either. But yeah. today we are figuring it out. Um and uh, basic, I'll give you the long and the short of it, folks. Essentially, that adding so much salt uh, to the environment uh, really changes our water uh, from being fresh water to being brackish water. And that has huge impacts on the fish and biodiversity and all that sort of stuff. And uh, additionally, so that's that's for the hippies out there who are big into the environment, but for you uh, folks who like your money and like not paying taxes, salt destroys um, your cars and the infrastructure over time. Uh, it's rust. It's um, sort of your potholes, all that sort of stuff. So it's you, the main cause. No, it's not actually, but it causes construction season. Oh, yeah. Like if you is. don't like construction season, yeah. you don't like salt. Yeah, but at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, very good point, Colleen. At the same time, everyone likes being safe on the roads. So today we're talking with Allison Madison. She is with Wisconsin SaltWise, and she is educating people on the harmful effects of road salt. Obviously, we all know the benefits. When you're driving down the road and it's cold out, and the roads are slippery, you're like, God, give me all the salt in the world. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the truth of it is, is one teaspoon of salt pollutes five gallons of water. And for every one dollar of salt use, we do about ten dollars of damage to our infrastructure. So, um, you know, in talking with Allison, it's not really a question of should we stop using salt? We are using salt and going to continue to use salt. But it's are we are we overdoing it? You know, um, if we did less, if we made brines, could we save money in the short term by using less of the actual salt and money in the long term by also using less salt? Yeah. So we kind of uh, do a deep dive into it. And that is coming up in short order here. In other news, <laughs> I went to the Packers game. Yeah. <laughs> I went to the Packers game. Colleen invited herself. <laughs> yeah <laughs> we went to the packers day together folks show a picture there you go look at us what? don't we look good oh you want us to okay i yeah. was under the guise that i was going to see taylor swift yeah Cal here, here. i would have seen her more if i just stayed home yeah you would have because you never they never showed her on the uh jumbotron Colleen was coming back from Minnesota. By the way, congratulations. Yes. I have a new niece, Miss Eva Grace. Eva Grace. She she's, is a cute one. She's, uh, we were just talking about it downstairs. It's not every day that you get to have, like, infants. I came out looking ugly. Yeah. Like, I, we, my brother and I joke that I peaked as a toddler. Like, I was a very cute toddler. But uh, not I came everybody. Out ugly, too. Just, like, not sure. a, I had hair everywhere. Like my back was very hairy. Oh, you had a hairy back? Oh, I, I'll have to show you. I'll put another picture up right here of my, um, you know, when they take a picture of you, like in when you're a baby, like right there, they'd use gauze to put my hair back. Really? And then my, I was so hairy. <laughs> I literally was like kind of looking like Benjamin Button-esque. Oh, like I was so not, funny. not cute. Um, but Eva is. She's a whole ass baby. She's so cute. Yeah. She's, she, yeah. She definitely takes after Megan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Love you, Lauren. No. I, I love the nice sisterly slam. No, well, but congratulations. Yes. And consequently, you stayed up in um, uh, Minnesota with your family yeah. a week after uh, Thanksgiving break because <laughs> you have such a great boss who's very flexible with your schedule. <laughs> yeah, um, especially like the Wednesday during that week. You're like, so what's your plan? <laughs> well, you know, I was like, you're not having this baby. What's going on? I know, but um, it was it was super great, and I. Just so glad I got to meet her and be there. And yeah, it's, I FaceTimed her last night. She's perfect. Yeah. And, um, I'm sure she'll remember that. Yeah. Um, how many hospitals have you gone to to wait for your none, siblings' kids? Never. 
weird. Not my not my siblings. I didn't go wait for my siblings' kids. I don't go wait for my siblings when I mean I'm second oldest. Yeah. Never have I ever been to a hospital waiting for a baby to come. Yeah. Nor would I. <laughs> I don't and <laughs> no and by the way, if I am ever fortunate enough to have a kid, I don't want any of my damn siblings in there, you know. It's not like I was in the room. I wasn't in the room. Oh, with you were her. in the waiting room. Yeah. Ah. Um, I wasn't there, and I didn't. want I still haven't been in the waiting room. Yeah. Either. Yeah, which is totally fine. Like, it was funny. Like, I got um, a text from my brother in our family chat. He was like, "Megan's this far along. Like, we're at this hospital. If you want to come, like, da da da." And then my parents are close with Megan's parents, which is great. And so then they text were like, "We're on our way." And so then my parents were dead asleep. Like mm -hmm. I was out with friends. Yeah. And so then I was like driving back from Minneapolis to my folks house. And I was 20 over the entire time way back. Thank you state troopers for not stopping oh, me. God. And I run in and I'm like, mom, dad, mom, dad, like Megan's in labor. We got to go. We got to go. And then, um, my mom's like, what, what? Oh my God. Oh my God. She gets up. My dad's like, and then like lays back down. <laughs> Good man. He's probably also like, you know, we'll go see in the morning. Right. You know? um, they and didn't then, go in either though. They didn't go in the delivery room. No, either. none of us were in the delivery room. Like us, okay. Megan's parents, and then Megan's brother, we all were sitting in the in the waiting room. Oh, got it. Wow. Well, yeah. that's like, that's uh, maybe that's just what normal people do. No, because the nurses were like, there's a whole ass family in the waiting room. Oh, like, okay. and it was like two in the morning and okay. we all were like, where is this kid? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah I, I would have. It's the first grandkid on either side, if you can tell. Uh, no, I know. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's very exciting. It's yeah. very exciting. Yeah. I was just stunned that 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 was, you know gonna be the thing that happened i know um but you know what that's love and i that's mean like good. It, we weren't like overstepping because lauren texted us and no then, for sure you know what i mean like he was like i'm just surprised that they were even interested in that, i know you know but good for them i know good for them but yeah it's Eva's, nice. she's gonna be a star i can't wait anyway but yeah, yeah so then i was coming back from that and i was already heading back to wisconsin and i jokingly texted you Hey, <laughs> you got an extra ticket to uh not Taylor Swift, the Packers game. Yeah. And <laughs> and my mom had just had to drop out of going to the game. I was gonna go with my mom, but she broke her knee walking. Like she was she tripped. She was kneecap. She wasn't just walking. Yeah, she broke her Oof. kneecap. Yeah, it took a hard, uh, hard fall. And um, oh, she was she was bummed. I think she wanted to see Taylor Swift too. Yeah. Uh, also the Packers, but she, uh, yeah, she was bummed. But you know what? I will say this: in Wisconsin, if you gotta mess up your leg, you know, actually, my dad had knee surgery yeah. recently, so now they both got bum knees. Mm. Uh, but if you gotta mess up your knee, you do it during the winter. You know, that is the time. You don't want to yes know though, because I had my knee surgery in the winter, and it's really slick. And like, if mine, I couldn't put any weight on it, so I had like crutches. Like yes, do it in yeah. the winter because you're bored. Yeah, you're bored. But I like mean, I like imagine like it's slick out. Well, just put more salt on the road. Don't. Well, duh, don't. and that's how we take it full circle, no, folks. Don't do that. There it is. Look at yeah. that transition. Anyways, we did go to the game. Yeah. Uh, Colleen did not behave herself. She was uh, openly asking me which one is Travis Kelsey almost immediately. No, I knew she, Travis. She cheered louder for when the Chiefs came on the field than the Packers. No, I didn't. A little bit. Just Travis. And I, no, I just was asking good questions. You zoomed in on that man's butt from like 50 yards away. Yeah. Like he's got I'm a tight a, end. Mm -hmm. He's got a tight end. Yeah. Did you just slurp into that? Oh, God. <laughs> Folks, luckily, we have more important things to talk about. Yeah. Um, before we get into that, though, you have tour dates coming up. We have a second show in New York City this weekend. We have tickets available left. So go CharlieBarons.com, CripesCast.com and click on tour. It'll be there. Same link. Yep. It's all good. We just added that show. Um, we're going to do two of them there, and it's going to be a fun time. And then also Eau Claire, I think that's Eau Claire sold, sold out. out. But then that's it for the rest of the year. All right. But then we got, I can't believe it's already like almost 2024, and we have a lot of shows coming up in the new year. Oh, yeah. So if you didn't get somebody something for Christmas, yes. and you're like, I want to spend the least amount of time thinking about this, just yeah. go to charliebarons.com uh, or go to 
uh, what man twog minute.com cripescast.com you know any of those websites click on the tour dates and then it's just like a few clicks and then uh it's the easiest gift to get and it like it seems like it's the most thoughtful one <sighs> Because they're like, oh, it's an experience we get to do together. And then you're like, oh, I was getting them for you and whoever yeah. you want to go yeah. with. But no, it's like a really sweet gift. I think that's a great idea. Uh, thank you. Not biased at all. Or folks, we have merch. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in the ad reads, though. Oh, all right. Well, we'll talk about that yeah. in the ad reads. And that's enough for this intro. And uh, oh, also, uh, I do want to say we've been doing this for the past couple months. Uh uh, we have Doctors Without Borders linked up in the show notes for mm -hmm. anybody looking to give back to this this ongoing uh, tragedy going on in the Middle East. Uh, Doctors Without Borders is there with medical supplies um, and much needed medical care. They are doing um, really incredible work. So uh, check them out, Doctors Without Borders, doctorswithoutborders.org, uh, linked up in the show notes. And with that, folks, let's get to my conversation with Allison Madison of Wisconsin Saltwise. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for uh, for joining us. So, where are you where are you uh, chiming in from again? You're coming from Madison. So I'm I'm down in Madison right now. Yeah, I grew up in northern Wisconsin. Oh, where in northern Wisconsin? I grew up in Bloomer. Have you heard of it? Bloomer. Way no. up there. Yeah. No. And <laughs> no. Um, now I'm. The, it's not often. You know, been doing this for quite some time now and it's not often i'm hearing a brand new sit you know what that's a lie every now and again one comes up like every few months so where is it on the hand so bloomer yes bloomer is about here it's just north of eau claire so oh, Chippewa okay mining kugels yeah yeah i mean i've probably been right around there so how far away is it from chippewa falls it's um just like 10 miles just down the road just yeah. down the the main drag or main, main drag, yeah, really yeah, fifty three, yeah. So uh, yeah, well, I grew up in Bloomer, three three thousand people, more cows than people. I mean, it's true for a lot of Wisconsin towns. I right? was gonna say, yeah, <laughs> that sounds impressive, but it's uh, it's more not, often no, no, than no, not. No. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no. uh, um, so and then what? When did you move out of there? Yeah, so I um, graduated from high school and went to school in Minnesota. And then, you know, I got I got teased for my Wisconsin accent enough that I decided I had to lose that. So wait, in Minnesota, uh, <laughs> they teased you for your Wisconsin accent? I know, right? People from Who? Iowa I was friends oh. with. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah. that's what you get for being friends with people from Iowa. You know, I know. You should... Idiots out walking around. Come on. Who are they uh. to tell me you don't talk right? <laughs> <laughs> so you got that's nice so uh what'd you study over it was this the university of minnesota um, i went to st olaf so good norwegian oh. girl, you know um yeah yeah had to yeah go wow. be an mm -hmm. nice nice studied i studied chemistry and environmental science okay cool yeah so very passionate about you know taking care of the, the planet <laughs> I um, grew up, you know, outside a lot in a small town, running around all the time, heading down to the water, hanging out, um, fishing, swimming, everything. So, um, yeah, when I learned more about some of the problems in the world, I'm like, I want to do something about that. Well, we're actually um, dealing with sort of a chemistry problem in this uh, podcast, uh, right? It's chemistry, salt and water. Yeah. It's a fairly salt. basic chemistry. That's about the the level of chemistry <laughs> that I dipped out at. You know? Yeah, um, no, no, I get it. <laughs> I um I'm kind of nerdy, yeah, studying chemistry and soil science too. Um, but I talk to plow operators every day and I, I try to make the chemistry kind of fun um for them. And sometimes they'll they'll tell me that I'm good at my job. So I feel like that's that's a win. That's um, a big win. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so all the salt that we put down on our streets in the winter, on winter roads, highways, parking lots, sidewalks. All of that salt, if it's doing its job, right, it's it's melting snow. And that means the salt is combining with that water and the water stays salty then. So we are trying to promote best practices so that people are using salt just as needed. And we want to encourage the mechanical removal of snow. So doing a better job plowing, better job out there with our shovels, 
And one of our slogans is shovel more, salt less, right? If you get out, shovel early enough and you might not even need salt. And that help, helps protect our drinking water and our lakes and streams and all the critters that live in them. And let's also take a step back and tell everybody what your organization is and how long you've been there and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I am the program manager at Wisconsin SaltWise. So SaltWise started in the Madison area with the city, the county, the wastewater treatment plant, the water utility, all saying, hmm, we, we kind of have a problem here. We're all seeing the amount of salt go up in our lakes, our streams, our drinking water wells, our wastewater. Maybe we need to come together and, and work on this. So they formed this local um, partnership called Wisconsin SaltWise, and they started doing education with plow operators and private contractors who do winter maintenance. And then all those folks are saying, yeah, like this makes sense. We we see that we're overplowing salt. We see all the damage that salt does to our vehicles and our roads and our bridges. It doesn't make sense. And the general public doesn't understand that. So if people feel like, you know, it's my right, I should be able to go out to, you know, Target or Walmart at, you know, 10 p.m. It doesn't matter if it's a crazy snowstorm. And that puts a lot of pressure on our plow operators um, to like, try to keep roads really clear all the time. Um, and so they said, you know, you need to do more kind of public education. So that's why SaltWise started. And I was hired in 2020 to really start working statewide around education and training. One of the biggest or most interesting um, facts uh, when doing research is that for every, um, for every, what, what, maybe and now I can't even think of it. Was it yeah, for every, every one? Teaspoon- one teaspoon of salt, we're polluting five gallons of water. And so that's the that's for the people who care about the environment. And a mm-hmm. lot of people don't. So mm-hmm. what's the financial? What's the financial one? I thought this was even more interesting. Yeah, the financial piece is for every dollar that we spend on salt, we're doing about ten dollars of damage to our infrastructure. So we look at, you know. Trucks putting down, you know, a ton of salt right now that costs roughly for the state, for our DOT, um, the cities, municipalities, counties, that it's about a hundred dollars, um, at just a little under, like about ninety dollars on average across the state for a ton of salt, and so that's doing like nine hundred thousand dollars of damage. And so, if I'm a kind of a skeptical person who's like, oh, the salt's fine," they're probably thinking like, "Well." you can't put a price on the lives salt saves is Mm -hmm. so is there an equivalent to salt something that does just as good of a job but is better for the environment but perhaps it's more expensive yeah so right now uh, the the best practices out there where people are seeing salt reductions and um, seeing no change to kind of level of service you know we're we can still have clear, passable roads. It's not necessarily a different product. It's just utilizing best practices in that mechanical removal. So different plow blades, um, sectional blades. So instead of like one straight blade, different sections allow uh, the blade to be a little bit more responsive to the pavement surface if it's not even and get a better scrape. So if you get a better scrape, you've got less material you have to salt right after and and remove. Um, There are also blades that have some rubber in them. um, So it works a little bit more like a squeegee Mm -hmm. and that can really get down, move a lot of material. And then um, even though it's salt, salt brine um, is kind of magic um, because if you have brine, you've already taken the salt, you've put it in water, it's dissolved and broken apart. So again, watch out for the chemistry, Charlie, but salt is sodium chloride, okay? So those two pieces, when you when you mix salt into water, they break apart yeah. and they individually are kind of what drive the melting. They have to be broken apart first. So if you break them apart in brine, um, by making that brine, you put that brine down on the road, on the snow, it begins melting immediately. It's kind of like using lighter fluid. And really, that's what we want. Everybody wants immediate melting. So using brine can help us get um, faster melting with less total salt, which means less corrosion uh, potential, but also we can still have pretty clear roads. So is there a reason like everybody isn't using brine right now? 
So yeah, the I'd say the biggest reason is kind of getting started, like you know, capital costs of making any changes um, to equipment are are real, right? And also, I think there's that you know, well, this is the way we've always done it, right? Why should we change and kind of use something different if our system you know seems to be working? Um, but we are actually seeing widespread movement, despite those two hurdles, widespread movement to utilize brine. The DOT, Wisconsin DOT, has been working with counties. So in Wisconsin, we have 72 counties, right? And they individually maintain the highways in their counties. So the DOT has been supporting them by helping them get high capacity brine makers. And then municipalities, more and more municipalities are getting brine makers. I, I work with universities like UW-Eau Claire. They're making their own brine on campus. UW-Whitewater uh, has been making their own brine for like six, seven years. So this is really, really taking off. Um, people are using brine before the storm. In Milwaukee, you probably see that, right? Especially Milwaukee County will put down those lines of brine yep, on, the, yep. on the road, right? So it kind of works like oiling your skillet. You know, if you put a little oil... Um, down first and then you fry your egg spatula comes comes right off but if you forget to do that you're scraping and scraping afterwards right so that idea that if you prevent the bond from forming you really end up ahead Um, and then brine can also be added to salt to help it stick in place so that reduces the bounce and scatter effect keeps the salt where we want it to be activates it it's working um, faster yeah well that's great because um you know there's quite a few um issues with salt uh that you know, we've kind of mentioned one, one I was curious about, um, you say it affects roads, excuse me, roads and bridges. Um, would it be safe to say that salt is helping cause potholes as well? Yeah. Salt, um, is corrosive, right? We, you know, we might make that connection with like our vehicles. Um, but salt degrades the roads. Anytime that you have like a little crack or a break, salt gets in there and it just makes it worse. So it, you know, prematurely ages, just accelerates the deterioration of roads. So anytime, you know, we're inconvenienced in the summer because of road repairs, it's like salt, you know, accelerated that. Got it. And then also, you know, in the Midwest, we obviously say, watch out for deer. Uh, deer <laughs> really like licking salt for anyone with a salt lick. They know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, do they, uh, since this is the same salt we're putting on our tables, does it attract more deer and animals to the roadways? That's a really good question, Charlie. I haven't heard so much of that in Wisconsin. I mean, I feel like there are so many deer <laughs> as it is, um, going across the roads. Um, but I have heard in Alaska that moose will come out to roads to lick the salt. I think there mm. might be you know, less salt um, up there. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just uh spitballing here, just trying to think <laughs> on that. Um, but uh, so what is the actual um, chemistry of the salt once it gets in the water? Cause it never leaves the water. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, at some point, are we going to have uh sort of, are our rivers going to be the brackish water you see in Florida, you know, where yeah, it's half salt water, half fresh? We're 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 headed in that direction, unfortunately. So yeah, I think some people say, oh, well, what does it matter? You know, that water's going down to the ocean, the ocean's salty, but um takes a while for it to get there, right? So um we definitely see throughout Wisconsin our water is not as fresh as it used to be. Um so naturally, if we look at salt again. The sodium and the chloride are the two components of that. So when it when salt dissolves, we look at them individually. So people will sometimes say, oh, the chloride levels are rising or the sodium levels are rising. Um, so that's just a little bit of background there. But yeah, both of those components of salt are increasing in our drinking water wells, um, which means in some areas, especially like Madison, our drinking water is getting to the point where some people can taste the salt in it. Um, and then our, our streams every year kind of getting saltier lakes every year, getting saltier. And especially in the spring months, when we got a lot of salty snow melt heading into those streams, we see big spikes in sodium and chloride levels. So naturally we'd be between zero and 10. If I look at, let's say the chloride, for instance, and we have streams that are in the hundreds, even the thousands 
I think where you are in Milwaukee, um, some streams have gone up to even 10,000 milligrams per liter <laughs> of chloride. So that's from zero to 10 up to 10,000. And that's, yeah, that's not good for any of the living things in there. So we're seeing changes in what can live and survive in our streams based on how salty they are. And some research in Milwaukee has actually looked at even down to the bacteria that live in the stream. So some streams in Milwaukee have gotten so salty that the bacteria living there more closely now re resemble the bacteria that live in like the Great Salt Lake. Wow. The zebra yeah. mussels are still doing fine though. Yeah. So that, oh yeah. I they're, mean, they're, they're great. <laughs> we got that going for us. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> but I want to say it's not all bad news, Charlie. Um, it's really incredible what we've seen happen. Um, a number of municipalities have been dialing in their salt use and working on that mechanical removal, um, utilizing brine. And they are dropping salt use by 50%, sometimes even 70%. Cudahy, just south of Milwaukee, has dropped their salt use by about 70% in the last several years. That's that's great. And And what is that... What is that process been like in Cudahy, for instance? Like, what what is um, what have they done there to acknowledge it, and and what has that process been like to sort of convince or just inform? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the first thing is, I, I told you that sometimes making these changes can be expensive, but the, the first step uh, is calibrating your equipment. So a lot of times when people put salt down, you know, especially back in the day and sometimes in smaller communities, it's just, well, you know, here are the keys go, you know, put down the salt and you don't necessarily know how much salt is going down. So calibrating trucks is a way to measure, actually literally weigh, you know, how much salt is coming out as the auger spins, weigh that, mm -hmm. um, do a little math to calculate how much salt per lane mile is going down. And then, um, based off of that kind of make adjustments, you know, are we going to be in setting one, two, three, four, five, kind of what makes sense. And then newer trucks really allow you to dial that in where you can say, okay, we want it to be, you know, 200 pounds per lane mile. Um, so some of the trucks that Cudahy had initially, they thought they were putting down, you know, 300 pounds a lane mile. They were putting down 800 pounds a lane mile. <laughs> so it's just like um, crazy when, <clears throat> as they made that little adjustment, um, brought down their salt use, just calibration alone, reduced their salting by over 40%. And then they were able to save those dollars and reinvest them in their fleet and start utilizing brine and, and made even further reductions. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, I would, what I find most interesting about the sort of salt thing is it's kind of a microcosm for like every other environmental issue that we have, mm -hmm. which is it's, uh, the way we've done it. Um, so you have, yeah. um, <laughs> you have the, uh, pattern, uh, already or the habit established and also the immediate cost of mm -hmm. not just, uh, doing something differently, but the cost of perhaps using a different product or changing your system. And yeah. we often see that as a bigger hurdle, even when we logically know that the future cost is going to be higher. Greater. Yeah. You know? no, and, and what is that? What Like, what is that about uh, human nature that that's like <laughs> how we interact? Cause I, I mean, it's not just them. I mean, it's, it's all of us, right? Every For time sure. I, I get into my car or turn a light on or whatever, um, you know, you know, in some way that this is, this is creating more greenhouse gas or whatever, but it's, it's hard to get people to think like doing this now will like, that's tomorrow's problem. You know, yeah. how, do, how have you found, uh, uh, what, what are effective tools in your mind to sort of break those natural human inclinations? Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I think about that all the time, both in terms of chemistry um, in chemistry, we call it activation energy. How much energy does it take to like break the bond and move to maybe something that'll be easier and, you know, in the end, but yeah. like anything you have changed, Oh, I got to do something different. Um, there's resistance to that. Right. And I think that, you know, we all want to do the, we want to do good things, but we also have a lot on our plate. And so one of my bosses would always say, you got to give people the easy button, you know, mm. you're not going to get them to do this if it's really tricky. Um, 
And I also think that, you know, evolutionarily, we're, we're humans, right? We're animals. We're just trying to survive. <laughs> and we're thinking about what is going to help me today. How do I get my food, my water, take care of my kids? You know, our brains aren't really designed to think about seven generations down the, the line. Yeah. Um, but I think that for me, one of the biggest things is like tapping into kind of that human connection with people. Um, like I said, a lot of the, you know, a lot of us, we, we're trying to do the best we can and nobody wants to be, you know, polluting the water. And a lot of the the plow operators I talk to, I mean, they're big outdoorsmen, right? They love hunting and fishing um, and they feel this pressure, right? Um, expectations people have, people who don't understand that that salt doesn't just disappear. It all goes somewhere. It goes into our water. So, you know, they want to do good things. And I feel like my job is getting around and talking to people um, like, it, you know, different highway departments. So he's up in Bayfield and we're talking with Bayfield County guys. Some of them have been plowing for, you know, 29, 30 years. <laughs> and um, we're just talking about, okay, what is your system like right now? Um, what was it like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, having them acknowledge that, yeah, things have changed in the last 20 and 10 years, they're going to continue to change. Mm -hmm. Um, how can we, you know, be open to that? Um, what's working, what's not in your current system? What do you think could make things better? So I kind of present, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a reason why we should think about change, um, reasons they care about, and then it's not prescriptive. There's no like one solution, one size fits all, but having people help be a part of that, that brainstorming and um, creative problem solving has been, I think, really successful and really fun. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, that that's the way it's, it's worked out. Um, and that the way you're describing it, um, I think is a successful, I mean, is successful clearly, um, because it's working, but it's also different than the way I think like a lot of environmental movements have been in the past which is we know more than you and so therefore mm -hmm. you need to listen to us and i think what a lot of i think the reason we part of the reason i think we're in the situation we're in is like human nature acts the way we expect it to and yet because some people have information they think just by saying that and demanding that yeah. it be done, it change. <laughs> and we've learned time and time again that it doesn't matter what the facts are. Yeah. People go off of emotion. And so instead of thinking you're going to fix this, whatever evolutionary trend led to that, you know, you have to play that, that human nature game. And yeah. so it's uh, that. So anyway, but it's also really practical. Like these are the people who have been doing it forever and know all the ins and outs and all the problems. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you going in and listening first and then maybe suggesting those ideas, I feel like is a sort of a system we can borrow for other environmental issues. Um, anyone yeah, who's think, trying to fix an issue can borrow what you're doing. Yeah. It's, it's acknowledging, I mean, these are practitioners with, like I said, years of experience, right? I remember I was in Fond du Lac, last fall doing a training with um, the city of Fond du Lac. And one of the plow operators had been working there for the city for 40 years. So I'm, I'm not even 40 years old. I mean, I'm getting close, but it's just like acknowledging there's a ton of knowledge here. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know some things, but I, I don't know at all. <laughs> and they're the ones who are going to be doing this work. So um, it just makes sense to yeah connect with them. They, they're the ones who can really figure out um, maybe like what should be piloted, you know, what what makes sense for the next step. And, and we're not going to change anything completely overnight. Right. Um, it's just about empowering people to take those baby steps and encouraging them. So I think sometimes my job is almost just like being a cheerleader. Right. Like I'll come in and talk about this is a problem. Um, here's some of the, the data that shows us that these are the trends that we're seeing. Um, but I also love sharing some of the, the best practices or the innovation that's out there. So if someone's using a new you know type of truck or a different brine blend, you can mix different things in your brine, believe it or not, um, or 
you know, just whatever's working or a change in the policy, um, sharing those stories. So people are like, oh, like that's working down the road. Yeah, maybe we could um, try that here. So one of the other things that's been really fun has been hosting equipment open houses. So we'll have a community like um, I mentioned Cudahy. I don't know if we've actually had one there, but um, like Sun Prairie around Madison or like the city of Eau Claire did one, I think Whitewater. And then all the neighboring municipalities can come and take a look and learn from the operators about newer technologies, changes that that community has made, and just have a lot of conversation. So that's operators talking to operators, you know, superintendents talking to superintendents. So I kind of help facilitate it, um, but they're the guys, usually it's guys, right, <laughs> who are going to be doing the work. So connecting them with one another has been really cool, too. Folks, excuse the interruption, but we have a new sponsor for the Cripes Cast. It is Everlight Solar. Uh, they do solar panels for your home, and they are powering, ladies and gentlemen, the Cripes Cast studio. That's right. We've got no electricity bill here. It is awesome. Uh, as you can see, these these um, uh, ceilings up here in my attic are on a nice pitch. And that's a good pitch uh, for these solar panels to sit yeah. on southern facing solar panels. Sun hits them good. Southern S facing? Snow goes right down. South is not that way. That's east. This is south. Bam. Yeah. That's north. Really? Never, wow. never eat shredded wheat. Wow. Anyway, yeah. we're powered by Everlight Solar. That's such a guy thing to do. I asked. Mansplain no, directions. No, I asked. Oh, you did. Okay. I did. All right. All right. Anyways, Anyways I'm in the right. <laughs> we are powered by Everlight Solar. It has never been easier, folks. I, I made the switch to solar and you can make the switch too. With Everlight Solar, you just take the money. You already pay for power and you shift it over to pay for solar panels that you own instead. So instead of renting, uh, you know, your house, it's like buying it. And you take the money you're already spending to rent to buy it. You you're know? saving so, money, essentially, if I do the girl math correctly. Yeah, I, I mean, you are saving yeah. money. Schedule your free consultation today at everlightsolar.com. And also, folks, Everlight Solar is hiring. They're hiring for all positions, including the industry's best summer year-round sales program, as well as flexible work-from-home jobs. Um, and, you know, get out there, work for them, and you can help thousands of homeowners go solar every single year. Uh, and they are growing very, very fast. So join the fastest growing industry in the world. Everlight Solar has open positions across the Midwest as a local company based near Madison with locations in the Twin Cities, Omaha, and opening a new location very soon right here in Milwaukee. Everlight Solar offers great opportunities to gain new skills and advance your career. Don't miss a chance to join the Everlight Solar team. Visit everlightsolar.com to apply today. Save money, save the planet. Start with Everlight Solar. And also folks, Fleet Farm. Fleet Farm makes shopping for Christmas gifts easier than ever before with free shipping on toys and clothing online at fleetfarm.com. Pick out the best toys for the kiddos on your wish list, whether they play with Spider-Man and Bluey or they're enjoying the farm toys and the work trucks. Or folks, find comfort and warmth from head to toe for every person in your family from brands like Carhartt and Columbia. And if you order by December 13th, it'll be there before Santa gets to your door. So you can give Santa a gift. Anyway, Aww. check it out, fleetfarm.com. And finally, folks, for all of you really looking to give the gift of Midwest love this holiday season, look no further than mantwalkman.com. We have great merchandise. I'm talking hoodies, and I'm talking uh, T-shirts, and cribbage boards, and bottle openers, and on and on and on it goes. And we got a deal for you. When you spend 55 bucks, just 55 bucks, you get a free deck of Man to Walk Man cards. You can, beep, 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 beep. you can play Euchre with them. You can play Sheep's Head with them. You can play 52 card pickup. 52 card pickup, spades, you know what that is, hearts, you diamonds. You know, you know what 52 card pickup is? Yeah, I know what 52 card pickup is. Do you think I don't what know is what it? 52? It's where you throw the cards and pick them up. Okay. <laughs> that's like saying, that's like the oldest one in the book, Kelly. BS. I like playing BS. BS is a fun game. Because you can game. scream it. Oh, and then, of course, drinking games you could play. Oh, yeah. King's you know, Cup. King's Cup. That. Putting them over the little Ride thing the until it goes. 
Yep, ride the bus. Yeah, all so those fun games. All those fun games, and all you gotta do is spend uh, fifty-five bones getting some folks some stuff for Christmas. You were gonna buy anyway, and our stuff's made in the U.S. Can't say that about a lot of stuff out there today. That's for sure. Better for the environment. Better <laughs> for uh, U.S. workers. Check it out, um, mantwogman.com. All right, folks, let's get uh, let's get back to the Cripes cast. Are there um, different things we can do from a road construction standpoint? I read um, some roads they're piloting are porous, and mm-hmm. that allows the concrete and the uh, soil underneath to um, evaporate some of the salt as opposed to having it run off. What what were, are the pros and cons of the that sort yeah, of porous? Yeah, so could- there's no real like. And it's like evaporation of salt, like it's all there. Once it goes down, it's going into our water. Um, but if we can have yeah more water kind of infiltrate through the um, through that pavement, then you don't have as much water necessarily like on the surface to to refreeze. And oh, I see. Re- that's it. That's what. Does that, that make is. sense? So yeah. the, so the the soil can't filter out the soil salt. can't. Yeah, soil. So. Soil <laughs> can't filter out the chloride. It actually does. It doesn't necessarily filter out, but soil grabs a hold of the sodium. Okay. So if we put salt down, you might see actually like along sidewalks sometimes where if there's a lot of salt, um, the grass is dead yeah. right along the sidewalk. And that is because salt's doing some damage to the to that vegetation, but it also changes the soil itself and it makes it more, more sodic, more sodium and uh, some of the other nutrients go through. So there's, yeah, a lot going on there with that chemistry, um, but the chloride just moves right through. So um, we, we aren't really filtering any of that out. And even like I said, that filtering um, it's not like it disappears. It's there. So back to the, like the permeable pavement, I'd say it's it's pretty new and people are trying to understand how does salt interact with the permeable pavement. And um, I was actually, I think this summer, listening to a scientist who was kind of doing some of the research around that. And they haven't totally, you know, determined like, yes, no, like good, bad. Um, I think that, you know, permeable pavement isn't necessarily something we're going to see widespread on our highways, but some things that people have noted at kind of a larger level are, you know, darker pavements absorb more heat, right? And then melting happens there faster and you can use less less salt. So people would say, you know, we can maybe have, what if we had darker, darker pavement? And a lot of times now our asphalt it doesn't have as much tar in it. And I think that's, you know, environmentally kind of a win, but it also means that our roads kind of bleach out and they get gray faster. So um, that's led to more salt. And See, that's, that's what I'm an, hearing from operators. Yeah. Well, that's, that's an interesting one too, because um, from a climate change perspective, you want uh, lighter colored mm-hmm. roofs and you want lighter colored yeah. roads to reflect the light back yeah, as opposed to effect. yeah as opposed absorb to absorb it. it so it's almost yeah. like now you're dealing with conflicting <laughs> environmental issues there it's 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 a wild one the other <laughs> thing too is you know i'm i'm very i don't want salt on the roads myself because i'm thinking about you know walleyes trout you know fishing mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff how it affects it but but as soon as it's like snowing and 22 <laughs> degrees. I'm like, give me that good salt. Yeah. Give me all that give good that salt. <laughs> I mean, so I'm as bad as anyone else, but you know, like when, when it's slippery and, um, it, that's that, that rain, um, snow mixture, oh, the wintry mix, that's the worst. Yeah. yeah you want, you want to know that you're going to be safe and, um, all that. And so I think the question with the brine, um, mm-hmm. and all that, is that as safe as, um, the salt, like for people who would be thinking in, in that, or yeah. is there a way I to mean, even measure I, that? I would say it's, it's just, it's equally as toxic as the salt. <laughs> um, so the, the benefit though, is that by using brine, you're reducing the total amount of salt that goes down. So brine literally is just salt mixed with water. It's 23.3%. If you want to geek out salt to water. So 
if you can use use that brine, like let's say a little pan cooking spray, right? If you use a little cooking spray on your skillet beforehand, just a little bit, and it makes a really big difference, you you know save it in the end um, quite a bit. So I would say that there are definitely misconceptions that brine is, you know, doing all this damage to your cars. Um, but it literally is salt and water. And if we use less total salt, that means less total ability to do, you know, corrosive um, damage, right? Are there any alternative? I've heard that um, breweries are using, um, have used the byproduct of the beer. Uh, mm-hmm. What is that? And is that something that can be um, sort of scaled up? Yeah, so there definitely are some kind of byproducts, agricultural byproducts. And I know the most popular one um, that people talk about is beet juice. And no one's just, you know, putting beet juice down on the roads. (laughs) I want to put that out there to begin with. Um, But the sugars from beet juices, the sugars from molasses, the sugars from um, from beer, malts can be mixed in um, with, with brine, with salt brine. So it's still salt, a little bit of sugar, um, but those sugars help the material stick. So especially if you do that brine before the storm, the sugars help it stay, Uh, stick around, stay on the road. Um, They also prevent refreeze. So think about like chomping into an ice cube or chomping into a popsicle, right? If you've got sugar mixed in with that water, it doesn't freeze as hard. It doesn't freeze as quickly. So if a plow puts down some brine with, you know, some sugar in it, and then it takes them two, three, four hours to get back, you know, to plow that road again, it's more likely that it'll still be kind of manageable, be able to move it. Um, And then sugars also actually reduce corrosion. So that's definitely a win for us with our vehicles and, and roadways. So, uh, but is it expensive? Would you see the people using sugar in sort of a mass, um, like yeah. DOT kind of way? Um, yeah, definitely. A lot of counties are utilizing those sugars. I would say we see the most use of it when we have colder pavement temperatures. Um, sodium chloride brine, straight salt brine is pretty effective. Or I should say straight salt is really effective down to 15, 15 Fahrenheit, one five. Um, and then when you start incorporating brine, you can maybe um, be using that down to, you know, close to zero, maybe like single digits. Um, but what happens is salt is it loses its effectiveness. It's just not as good at melting. It melts so slowly when you get um, to those colder temps that you need to use something else or you're just going to keep throwing salt down. And you've probably seen that on sidewalks sometimes, right? The salt's sitting there if it's real cold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, by utilizing brines that have magnesium chloride or calcium chloride mixed in, those can be more corrosive. They can actually do more damage, but um, it's because they're like bigger, badder cousins of sodium chloride and they work at colder temps. So if you use those other chlorides, you usually are mixing in another sugar to help counteract um, that corrosivity and again, prevent the refreeze at those really cold temps. Got it. Got it. And are those worse for um, the environment? I'd say that the jury's kind of, you know, mixed on that. It's like you can scientists <laughs> will look at, you know, individual like how does it impact a trout? Magnesium right. chloride versus calcium chloride versus sodium chloride. How does it impact the salamander? Magnesium versus calcium versus sodium. And it's like it's kind of mixed out there. Like some are better or worse for, you know, different organisms. But in general, they're all chlorides, right? So if we put more chloride down, chloride's toxic, it reduces the rates of growth, reduces reduces rates of reproduction. It just it's a stressor on the system of these organisms that like your walleye, right. That have evolved to live in fresh water. Yeah. Um, and are there any species that are, um, extremely threatened from this that, uh, stand out more than other species? Yeah. The, like the general, um, like think about the food web, um, little zooplankton. Those are tiny little guys that we generally don't think about too much, but they're food for small fish. Their populations we're seeing are changing quite a bit, being impacted at 50, five zero milligrams per liter. So that's um, a lot less salty than a number of our streams today. So, and lakes too. Um, so as zooplankton populations go down, it means there's less food going up the food chain. 
And also, if we don't have as many zooplankton, we don't have as many things eating algae. So that's creating um, more kind of green, murkier waters. Now that's in addition to, you know, phosphorus that's maybe coming off of, you know, farm fields or historical, you know, like phosphorus that's in our lake sediment. So it's not, it's not great. It's like all these kind of interactions, right, happening together. Um, and salt can also, will also cause the release of other metals into water. So the lead crisis in Flint was actually exacerbated by the fact that they were drawing saltier water from the Flint River. Mm. So I know we still have some lead pipes, you know, in Milwaukee. Um, but thankfully, Milwaukee water is Lake Michigan. And Lake Michigan's a really, really big lake. So even though it's receiving over a million tons of salt a year, it has the ability to dilute a lot of that more than our smaller lakes and streams. Um, uh, maybe a weird question, but those zebra mussels I mentioned earlier are a big filter. Uh, that's their one benefit. And also mm -hmm. it's a detriment to the ecosystem. <laughs> yeah. um, do they happen to filter out any of the chloride? Not really. There's, there's been look at like, well, could, um, could we use something that, you know, could filter out or like bioaccumulate, you know, that, that salt, mm -hmm. um, like some different plants, but the problem is like, okay, so it's in the, even if it was in the body of, of like a, a filter or, or like a plant that could do that, um, what, what are you going to do? You got to like remove that from the ecosystem or when that organism dies or is eaten or whatever, it's just, it's still in that system. It's still in the system. And yeah. there's, there's not, um, you know, desalinization again is a very expensive process that, you know, people in, um, uh, desert areas know, or, uh, Southern mm -hmm. California or whatever, um, is that a viable option to help improve the waters as they are right now? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot. Can we just like pull the salt out? So um, the answer is like technically, yes, right? Like you said, you can remove salt from water, but it's really expensive. And in Madison, I know the wastewater treatment plant, they tried to run the numbers on this because they're receiving salt, not just in the winter, or the spring from snowmelt, but they received salt year round from water softeners, right? So all those water softeners that we like to, you know, filter oh. out, take care of the hardness, right? All of that salt comes to a wastewater treatment plant and then they can't filter it out. They can't remove it. So they're sending it all downstream and they're like, this is not good. <laughs> it's not good. So could we do it? Yes. Yes. Technically you can, um, but it would increase the sewerage rates by 500%. So it's not really feasible to do that. And it's so economically so expensive because it's really energetically expensive. It would take a lot of energy, which means a lot of greenhouse gases to filter that out. It'd be running all of our wastewater through reverse osmosis. So it's not practical. And it's definitely not practical to think we're going to filter out the salt from our lakes or streams because that would be killing everything in them. Just like you said, you know, the zebra mussels, right? They filter things out and it's not actually good. <laughs> we mm -hmm. can't just like run all of our lakes through a, a filter. Yeah. And that brings up uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, ask you about before we leave. What Water softeners for those maybe new homeowners or you know, younger people who don't really know what a water softener is. Can you explain that? Explain why people use them and um, why they're problematic? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I actually, I grew up, as I mentioned earlier, north of Eau Claire, and we didn't have a water softener. No one had a water softener because our water wasn't hard. <laughs> so, what is hard water? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you um, will see people in Southern and Eastern Wisconsin um, have water softeners, have this little like appliance, um, extra, extra appliance in their basement. And the idea is it is taking care of water hardness. So hard water is water that has calcium or calcium and magnesium in it. And that's because the water has been sitting in calcium <laughs> bedrock. Calcium carbonate is a fancy way to say limestone. So mm -hmm. if you have water sitting in limestone, it dissolves some of that calcium, calcium magnesium. And then when it comes up into your house, that calcium magnesium can kind of re like crystallize um, with 
carbonate and form that limestone, reform that limestone, but now it's in your pipes or it's in your tea kettle. So you see that like white scale in your tea kettle and that'd be happening in your hot water heater and your, your hot water pipe. So what people will do is they will send their hot water through a water softener and you dump salt, like literally sodium chloride, table salt, but it's, it's big, it's chunkier. It's maybe not as clean. You won't, don't, don't recommend eating it. Um, you dump that into your water softener and um, the fancy science in there, what's happening is the sodium takes the place of the calcium and magnesium. So um, you don't have hard water. You have now soft, sofa, um, softened sodium water. And that doesn't create the scale issue, the scale buildup, but all of that sodium, you know, it's your wastewater. It's going to go down um, to your wastewater treatment plant and the chloride just goes straight there along with the, the calcium and the magnesium. So again, nothing disappears, nothing goes away. We add it to our water. It sticks around in our water. So with water softeners, you really want to make sure that you don't have like the old clunker. Um, the really old systems would just regenerate every like two or three days, regardless of how much soft water you'd use. So it's kind of like you, Charlie, would say every three days, you're going to go down to Quick Trip. You're going to dump out any gas in your gas tank and fill it up again because it's been three days, mm. <laughs> you know, regardless of how many miles you've driven. Um, so newer softeners will only regenerate when you have used up the soft water capacity. So kind of like your gas you know, tank is empty and you're going to fill it up. That's what makes sense. Um, and then just like our cars, you know, you can have a more or less efficient um, vehicle, more miles per gallon. Um, your water softener can be more efficient in terms of um, salt to soften water ratio. So definitely want to, you know, think about, do you really need a water softener? Um, if so, kind of going with a really efficient model. And just like we have electric cars today are kind of, you know, taken off, um, that technology is making more and more sense. There are different, there are alternatives to traditional salt-based softeners that might make sense for people. And I'm still kind of an idiot on this, so forgive me. Oh, no, but no. <laughs> I, I still understand, like, what is the problem with hard water? Is it bad for your health? No, it's not bad for your health at all. Um, calcium, magnesium, your body actually needs them. Um, it's mostly, and you, you're in Milwaukee, right? So you're drinking like Michigan. I mean, I don't have a water softener. Yeah. I live yeah. In so you don't, you don't need one because Lake Michigan is naturally pretty soft. Okay. Um, but if you have spent time like closer to, I don't know, just inland a little bit, I feel like say even like, you know, Oshkosh or Whitewater, Madison, yeah. um, when people boil water, like in a kettle, um, or teapot, they'll see this white scale kind of build up. Oh, I got that on some of my cups sometimes. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so that scale buildup is something that is not aesthetically pleasing to people. And maybe it starts to build up on your shower head. Um, so I'd say that's the main thing. It's that concern oh. of the scale buildup. And does it make your water heater not last as long? Um, I know mm. people are also thinking about like, especially women or anybody who's got longer hair, you know, like hard water with your hair, like, mm. does that feel good? So maybe you want softened water when you take a shower. Oh, uh, okay. And there's no conditioner or something that helps with that. <laughs> I'm yeah, an well, idiot. I, I no, no. My, so <laughs> my grandmother actually used to, when I was a kid, she'd rinse my hair um, with vinegar water to kind of take um, like hard water, off of it or I don't know if it was for that or she would say but I was like vinegar is what you use to cut the scale so like my tea kettle every you know week or so a few weeks I'll just scrub it with some vinegar water and that scale comes right off okay okay so I mean yeah it, there are other solutions for it beyond putting salt in the water basically yeah there are other things to look at um it's yeah I feel like it's kind of hard right now. It's like, I'm not going to tell everyone go out and buy an electric vehicle. Like that might not make sense to you. So I don't want to tell everybody, oh, like you got to disconnect your salt-based softener and try something that's a little uncertain, you know, but mm -hmm. at least if you've got one, make sure you're, it's running as efficiently as possible. Well, very cool. Very cool. Um, is there anything that we haven't uh, addressed yet that you think uh, would be good? Something I missed? Any important facts? Yeah. Um, 
I'd say a, a couple things. So one would be that, you know, things that people in the like the general public, if you're not a snowplow operator, things that you can do would be just, you know, if you don't have to go somewhere in the middle or right after a snowstorm, like stay home, stay safe, um, get kind of cozy in the winter. And if you do have to go out, leave early and leave space, um, especially leave space for those, you know, between you and the plows. I know in St. Croix County, um, Hudson area, Northwestern Wisconsin, there were 13 plow operators that got rear-ended last winter by vehicles, people who were driving too fast um, for the conditions. And, you know, that really, that's scary <laughs> and also really hurts morale um, for these people who are out in all crazy conditions, right? And crazy hours that they work in the winter to help us keep our roads clear. And I think we need to really support them and acknowledge the work they're doing instead of complaining that, you know, they haven't come to our street yet. So um, just kind of, I, I like to celebrate those public works guys and, and gals. A, there are some gals too. <laughs> that's a, that's a really good note. Yeah. I mean, you, you only talk about the plow guy, historically speaking, if your road's not plowed, but, you know, giving mm -hmm. them a shout out because so many of the roads are plowed and uh, what a pain in the ass of a job. And oh they, my goodness. Yeah. And they are <laughs> in the most dangerous road conditions. And, you know, you always feel good when you see, you're on the highway and you see like a mile ahead, a plow in front of you. And if you're way behind them, you're like, all right, I'm okay right now. You know, yeah. so they yeah. do a lot. <laughs> And um, one of the other things we're doing this winter, um, we've done in Wisconsin a few years, but this year it's going to be National Winter Salt Awareness Week. So I remember last year you did a little shout out for us. That was awesome. Um, and this year we're connecting with different agencies across the country from, you know, Maine and New York State to Montana to support um, more education and awareness around the pollution that we see from salt, but also the reduction solution. So that's really exciting. January 22nd through the 26th, and we'll have uh, free webinars every day, kind of over the, the noon hour. At least it'll be the noon hour for people in Wisconsin. Um, yeah, so that's, I'd say those are my kind of points for people. And then I, I was prepping Charlie, I was thinking like, how do I how do I introduce myself? So do you mind if I tell you a couple of stories about? Oh, my Walmart? God. Yeah, please. <laughs> Jeez, I didn't know you were okay. prepping here. <laughs> tell me something. Yeah. So so I got I grew up in Bloomer in northwestern Wisconsin. And um, people will sometimes ask, yeah, where is that from? I know my mom got, oh, is it south of the, the Brazier? <laughs> and um, <laughs> so people like to make little jokes. But Bloomer is actually the jump rope capital of the world. Um, so that's up. our one claim to fame. No. So I grew up doing jump rope in, in PE class where instead of, you know, a basketball unit, we had a jump rope unit and we had speed jumping. So you had to get as many jumps as you could in 10 seconds. Let me tell you, Charlie, that was a lot of pressure to put on a little, you know, five-year-olds that have to go, st you know, stand and jump in the middle of a circle of their peers and everybody looks at them and I was not a very good jumper. So <laughs> I think how I got how many did you get? How many did I you had get? like 20, 20 some jumps in 10 seconds. Um but well, that's pretty I, good. It's not though the the record let me, the record, let me think it when yeah, I what's was the a record? Kid, in 10 seconds 74 jumps. Oh man. So you gotta be, um, you gotta be cooking on that jump rope by the time it's <laughs> once. Do you get, do you get to like build up to that or do you just have to go? You just, you just go, you okay. just go. Yep. 10 seconds from impressive. zero to, you know, 74 jumps in 10 seconds. But, yeah, um, yeah. So jump rope capped the world. And as a small town, um, our mayor, Randy Summerfield, who was the mayor for years. Sounds like such a mayor name. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So he um, was also an EMT. So okay. he rode with my mom in the ambulance when little Allison was going to be born. Oh, wow. Right, right. And then he also um, owned and was the bartender for a local supper club. So everybody called it Randy's. I think technically it was two acres, but you'd go to Randy's every Friday night. Uh, you would get your you know order in. And mom and dad would, you know, drink a beer with their buds at the bar. And then, you know, maybe my brother and I would get a quarter or two for the pinball machine. 
And then we'd, we'd have our fish. Randy's kids would serve the, you know, at the tables, Randy was the bartender and his wife was the cook. So that is, wow. that is small town life in Northern Wisconsin for you. I love all of that. And uh, <laughs> follow up on the jump rope thing. Did you yeah. do a uh, jump rope for heart? Do you remember that? Like the American Heart Association? I do remember that. Yeah, I think that was like kind of wrapped into our unit. Okay, yeah, because I remember, th- I just remember in gym class, we had a jump rope thing too, and you'd always be jumping for like ever. And then um, the person who jumped the longest, longest. got some <laughs> prize. And there'd always be some kid who like stopped, you know, but no one saw it. And then they just started again. But then (laughs) one kid saw them stop and was like calling them out. You know, I won't tell you which kid I was, but um, (laughs) anyway, that's what that reminded me of. And then I love the fact that the mayor is also the EMT and the bartender at the deal. So uh, I got to get over to Bloomer is what it sounds like. Got to get over to Randy's. Have yeah. the walleye. <laughs> Main Street Cafe Pies and uh, Bohemian Ovens. Also two good places to check out. So Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, I am uh, I think I'm going to be up there in the summer. I think I'm doing the um, one of the state fairs up there. Um, so oh, the Northwestern Wisconsin State Fair? That's in I, Chippewa. Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure if we officially are doing that yet or not, but uh, I know it's potentially on the radar. Um, so anyway, if I'm up there for that, I'm going to go over to Bloomer, get, get it going. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and, uh, I think it's, you know, really informative for, it was very informative for me. So I'm, I'm sure it'll be informative for a lot of folks. So I appreciate you. you. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Have a good one. All right. Take care now. (laughs) Well, that was it for this week's episode of the Cripes Cast. Colleen, where can people go to find more about salt? So if you want to check out what Allison is doing with Wisconsin Saltwise, it's W-I-S-A-L-T, W-I-S-E dot com. W-I-S-A-L-T-Wise. Alt-Wise. Yeah, exactly. Right. Across the board on all social media. Um, yeah, she's it's great stuff that they're doing here in Wisconsin. And they have a lot of information online of like all the facts and figures and how you can change just like one little thing that you're doing to help decrease that song about in the environment. So go check it out. WISaltwise.com. Follow us on all platforms at Cripescast. And if you want to leave a comment, review and all of that stuff, do it wherever you listen to your podcast, Cripescast podcast across the board. We have full video options on Spotify and YouTube. And if you want to find um, behind the scenes, never before seen exclusive content, like Charlie breaking this, brandy bottle and then having to clean it up i have add um, i'll put it back go to patreon.com slash charlie barons thank you very much folks That's all I got. thank you so much for listening i hope you all have a wonderful week thanks to kelly maraca for producing this sucker hannah milos for editing this sucker and thanks to all of you for listening we will see you next week so roll out the barrel and get the band brewing life's got you down just keep her moving it's on Wisconsin, the Badgers say it's the old Wisconsin Jubilee. You know, sometimes when you're ice fishing, you put your foot in the walleye hole and go ass over tea kettle and you think you're done. No, you gotta keep her moving. 